everybody. There we go. Uh, my name is Frank. You guys, most of you know me by now. The, I'm the director of the program, but also I am an FSU uh, Florence alum from 1994. And the program changed my life so much that uh, here we are today, all these years later. This is the second event in our alumni lecture series. Our plan moving forward is to have one of these alumni lectures every semester. So we're thinking about four times a year, perhaps, as we move forward and into the post-COVID period. And today we're fortunate enough not to be in red zone any longer. So we do have a few guests, special guests in attendance. And today we'll be bringing to you a, a very special moment and a very important uh, uh, moment in FSU's history here in Italy in that back in 2015, uh, our program at Cetomura del Chianti made an amazing discovery at our archeological site. And an exhibition of that discovery just opened uh, last Saturday. And I know since a lot of you, although you'd love to be here in Italy right now to see it in Siena, we thought the next best thing would be to bring it to you from Florence uh, to your homes, wherever you may, to wherever you may be. Uh, in attendance today, uh, besides Dr. de Grummond, who will be leading this lecture called The Treasure of Chianti, we have our two Chetamura interns, Nina and Jamie, who are lucky enough to be here thanks to a scholarship by Dr. Rodney Reeves, uh, formerly of the medical school in FSU whose generosity uh, allowed these two young interns to come. And they're working diligently away on our first in-house exhibition at the Florence Study Center. So we are quite excited to have uh, Jamie and Nina here with us. We also have uh, Dr. de Grumman's lead <laughs> researcher uh, with us in attendance today, in case you all have uh, questions on numismatics and some of the research that went into uncovering the mysteries of this great discovery at Chetumura. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Holland Goldwaith from UNC Asheville uh, is here with us as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce, of course, the beloved Dr. Nancy de Grumman of the Classics Department at FSU and who has been the head of our archaeological site at Chetamura, the director of it, since 1981, I believe. So come on up, Dr. de Grumman, and thank you for sharing this wonderful discovery with us today. And I'll start the slideshow for you. Thank you very much, Frank, and thanks to Charlie Panarella and Hannah Meister for setting everything up. This is an absolutely totally new situation for me to be speaking to a wonderful live audience of great friends who came tonight and to be speaking to um, people I've already noticed looking at Zoom who's there and um, I feel like I'm at home, this home folks here that uh, are connected with Florida State University. And so I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to speak about this wonderful moment at uh, Florida State that we have with showing these wonderful coins that we found in 2015. And I have with me tonight my dear friend and colleague, Laura Holland Goldthwaite from the University of North Carolina at Asheville. She is not actually presenting. She's here to answer the questions that I can't answer. I have to confess as the director of the site, my job is not so much to do the actual research on things, but to find the best people to take care of those researches. And Laura and I've worked together for a number of years. She was my lab director for five years at Chetamora. She's not strictly speaking a Florida State alum, but she's been with us quite a long time. 
So let's go to our first slide, if we can get it to change. And if we can't, I'm pressing buttons. Not skipped ahead. Try again. Ah, that's the one I wanted. Okay, this is the main poster for the show we have just opened in Siena called Il Tesoro del Chianti. We worried for years about exactly what to call it because we don't like using the uh, term hoard of coins. This uh, is something which seems to incite greed. And we really don't want that to happen. But our inspector, our um, functionary, funcionario for Cetamora, Dr. Jacopo Taboli, is the one who suggested that we call it Tesoro del Chianti. And we've had a really wonderful time working with the best people in putting up that show. And uh, I've written their names there. Many of them I will mention again as we go along, but I just wanted to make sure at the beginning that's on the screen and we record our thanks to these great collaborators that we have had. First and foremost, I want to mention that two of my former students who are connected with Florida State University came to Italy, especially for this event and to help me to prepare for it. One of those is Jesse Rassall. Um, Jesse got her master's in museum and cultural heritage studies at Florida State University on the Tallahassee campus. And she is now employed as coordinator of accessibility and inclusion at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science in Raleigh. Jessie came for one week. She was absolutely essential. She is the person who understands where to put things in the cases and how to make the whole thing come together at the end. She's pictured here when she came again for one week, back in 2018, when we had a gala for Chetamora in Gaiolian Chianti, the town that is nearest to Chetamora, and where we hope eventually there will be a museum that opens up for Chetamora. That was at Christmas time, obviously. And then with me tonight is my dear friend, Katie Brown. Katie was my student in the 80s. She was a program assistant here in Florence, and I think it's 89, got that right that time. And now Katie has had a marvelous career as an art historian, publishing books on uh, late medieval and Renaissance art, especially religious nature. And uh, she is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Walsh University in North Canton, Ohio. She has been our coordinator who has kept all the dates and made us all aware of what we were supposed to be doing when. I call her my chief of staff. And I think I'm really lucky to have a Dean of Arts and Sciences as my chief of staff. So this is all about the connection between the site of Chetamora and Florida State University. So I wanna quickly go over a little bit of a timeline here. Uh, Chetamora was first discovered by the Italian Alvaro Tracchi on the property of Badia Acolti Buono in Chianti. And he had reported this to the superintendent of antiquities here in Florence as is appropriate when someone discovers an archeological site. And so it was then when the director of the Florence program at that time, Fred Licht and Professor John Reich went to him and asked for permission to dig a site with the Florida State University students. And so they got the permit to dig at Chetamora. And at that time, Chetamora excavations were born as a course in this program. And um, so in, on the weekends, the students would go, live in tents, cook soup over the fire, persist through the rain, difficult conditions, hurry off to wash their pottery, and then come back to Florence for their regular studies during the week of Italian, art, history, music, the courses that were being offered. We began to get students who really wanted to major in archaeology. And so it came time to change the nature of uh, the excavations at Chetamora. And I was in on this. Uh, I first taught at Florida State University as an adjunct in 1968. And I held that position for nine years. Finally, in 1977, I was hired as a professor on a, a tenure track. 
And I had taken a great interest in the excavations, although I had not really participated myself. And I suggested that we convert the course in the Florence program to a summer field school where we could have Florida State University students who were majoring in archeology span and who could spend full time on this particular project. And at that time, I was the administrator as uh, John Reich and other professors here at the program in Florence would go and direct the excavations. So um, when John Reich retired from directing the excavations at Chittamora, I offered to be the interim director. I said that I would do it for three years. I had had some field archeology. span I was working more with art history at the time, but I thought I could hold the rope until the Department of Classics at FSU found somebody to direct. And you can see what happened. Um, I became the real director um, and I didn't want to give up that position to anybody else. I have loved having this in my career and I'll, I'll keep trudging up that hill until I can't do it anymore. And I'm very happy about the recent developments. We give exhibitions regularly. We've given exhibitions on Chetamora in 2000, 2009, and most recently in 2017, we did quite a grand exhibition here in Florence at the Museo Archeologico of finds from um, two wells that we had excavated. And at that time, we began to renew our connection with the Florence program and especially with Frank Nero, who participated with us and claimed us, called us part of the whole program here. And uh, it is a joy to continue working with Nero. Uh, he does have an empire and I'm very happy to be part of it. And um, so I wanna thank him especially for all he's done continues to do. So just a little bit of background about how we started the trench where we found this hoard or tesoro of coins. We had been excavating in two wells. You see before you a view down into well number one, which we excavated with the help of the archeological firm called Ignos of Montelupo Fiorentino. They did wonderful work all the way to the bottom, 32 plus meters, which we calculated to be exactly 100 Etruscan feet, it was an Etruscan well with um, remains of both the Etruscan and the Roman periods. It remained in use in Roman times. And at that time, we had a rather famous alum of the FSU Florence program working for us as the registrar for the thousands of objects, all the different kinds of things that came out of that well. And that was Cheryl Souter, who after getting her master's at FSU, went on to teach at uh, Jacksonville University and to um, come back to us after having actually been in the field in 1976. She rejoined us and uh, we profited enormously from having her help. Now, there you see the well operation in the background and Cheryl in front at her desk and along with her, Amanda Riles, who worked at Chetamora over a number of seasons and was her trusty assistant in processing all the different kinds of materials that came out of the well. I wanted to show you this because it's exactly underneath Cheryl's table that we set the new trench where we actually found the pot full of silver coins. Little did we know as we walked back and forth and did all of the business of taking care of what came out of the well. It was a very busy site. It was um, always people running and coming and going and trying to stay calm amidst it all. Um, and so I did not really want to allow anyone to dig near the well during that period. But after we finished, then we sank a trench just exactly in that area. And this is it. And we had two students who were in charge of it. First, a graduate student named Christina Cha, and then an undergraduate was keeping the notebook, uh, Rachel Wood. And they found 
almost nothing in that trench. In the topsoil, which was sort of contaminated, they found a, a Lego, you know, a child's toy. And they kept digging and finding nothing, maybe a little bit of tile or something like that. And then one day, Rachel came to us and she said, Dr. DeGroman, we found something rather strange. And so I'm going to turn the trench around here. This is a view of a big hole next to the bedrock. And it turns out this is probably a quarry for sandstone that was backfilled at some point. And we're um, finishing digging in this area. So I think we'll soon know more about that particular aspect. But um, I'm going to turn the slide around. You can watch the north arrow there and see it from another view. And you see this little bulb sticking up there in the soil. And that is this vessel that was filled with 194 silver coins. And here's a close up of it. And they brought me over and showed it to me. And I said, I've never seen anything like that before at Chetamora. What on earth can it be? And uh, it was obviously a vessel which was pretty much intact. And um, I think Rachel was happy that I stepped in and did the excavation. And I called Laura from the workroom so that she could be there when it came out, uh, looking at this darling pot. Uh, after we found out it was filled with silver, we gave it a nickname. We called it Argento, uh, the word for silver in Italian. So this is looking at Argento and um, carefully working around it to extract it from the ground. We knew it was upside down and we pulled it out. It was not completely intact. Actually, um, the neck of it had been broken in antiquity. Later on, we realized that that was because they needed to insert coins into it. And so there I'm holding it in my hands. You get some idea of its size. And then there is Laura who is packing it to take it off the site and then uh, deliver it to um, the Studio Arts College International called Saatchi in Florence <clears throat> run by Professor Nora Morosi. And so we didn't excavate this ourselves. We sent it to the lab so that it would be treated properly. And um, this is called micro excavation, which um, Nora Morosi was in charge of. And uh, you see the beginning of the excavation there. They had done x-rays, they had weighed it. It weighed over 800 grams, which was, we knew it was very heavy to begin with, but we had no idea what was in there. The x-rays seemed to show a very dense mass of metal and there was even the conjecture that it might be lead. And so I was a little surprised when in November, I got an email from them and they said, we're finding pieces of metal with writing on them. And it turned out that that was uh, the coins that they were bringing out. And here you see, you get some idea of the size of the little jug too, by the human hand that's next to it and the tiny little coin that is being pulled out of it. And we think it might be a, a kind of vessel that was regularly used like a, a little piggy bank. There definitely are such uh, vessels that were created in Hellenistic times, the third and second centuries BCE, often with the slot for the coins already in them. So that's what I'm showing to you there. So they pulled out the coins and this is what they looked like when they first came out. Obviously they needed a great deal of cleaning, uh, conservation. And so uh, for years now, Nora and her students and assistants have been working on cleaning the coins so they would be ready for our exhibition. This is her student, Kim Roach. Um, after November, when I first learned that they were finding the coins, I had planned to come for the spring semester to do research here in Italy. And so it was that they suspended the micro excavation and I was able to be there while they were bringing out the coins. And we were recording them with a, a special kind of microscope. 
uh, digital microscope photography and uh, putting those on a computer. And then we called Laura on Skype. She was sitting in her office in Asheville. And as we would bring up a new coin and photograph it, she would be flipping through the books and she would say, oh, well, that's a coin of Julius Caesar, which dates to 49 BCE. And we were just getting instant gratification from that. And then it was that the long and tedious procedures of cleaning these coins began. So uh, Nora counted over 100 students at Saatchi and also at Florida State University who assisted in the cleaning. At the end, um, she had to move the coins um, from Saatchi because the school closed and uh, our inspector, Jacopo Taboli, suggested that she move them to um, the museum, Santa Maria della Scala in Siena, which is right across the piazza from the Duomo in Siena, a very prestigious location. And so she worked there for several months, finishing cleaning and doing a very important photography project I'll tell you a little more about later. And we are very grateful to those at Santa Maria della Scala for all of their welcoming hospitality through the months that she was working there. What did we find? Okay, um, there are 194 silver coins in all. 178 of them are of the um, denomination of denarius. And you probably know that during the period of the Roman Republic, this was like the dollar. It was the basic unit of currency for the Romans. We also found in the hoard 16 of the denomination called quinarius which is half the value of the denarius. Denarius means that it's something multiplied by 10. Quinarius is something multiplied by five. Therefore, it's worth half of the denarius. And with the research of Laura, we know that the earliest datable coin is probably somewhere around 169, maybe a little later. And then the latest datable coin belongs to 27 BCE and no later. We call this a terminus antiquem. This is a term I always make my students learn. It's the end before which um, the last coin was deposited. And that's very interesting because 27 is precisely the year when Octavian got the name of Augustus. There are no coins with the name Augustus on them. Therefore, this collection of coins dates right before he became Augustus. And a further clue as to why it is there is provided by the fact that there are 22 coins in it with the fleet of Mark Antony and his paramour, the queen, the Egyptian queen, Cleopatra. So we have to ask why are those coins of Mark Antony there? And the best hypothesis we have come up with is that it's all about the Battle of Actium which took place on September 2nd in 31 BCE. So the coins of Antony do not date later than that date. And the scenario is that when Octavian had defeated Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium, soon after that, they committed suicide and Octavian recovered their war chests and so was able to take over all of their money that they were going to pay their sailors and soldiers with and use that money to pay his own people. So the hypothesis is that this was the pay of a veteran of the battles of Octavian slash Augustus against Antony and Cleopatra and very possibly the Battle of Actium itself. There were other minor uh, confrontations and skirmishes during those years, but this is the one which was most decisive. And so you're looking at the portraits of Antony and Octavian and then one of the 22 coins that shows the warships of Antony. And a very interesting thing about those coins that we've been able to find out is that they have a lower content of silver than the other coins that we've been able to uh, examine in that way so far. And it seems that Antony was putting out a huge issue of coins, slightly debased so that he could make his silver stretch farther. And here we have the coin of Antony 
Cleopatra is on the other side. This is a rather rare coin. There aren't many like this, dating to 32 BCE. And people who know their Roman history think, well, Mark Antony, that, that looks kind of the way we might expect from what we know about him, a kind of uh, swashbuckling, um, partying type. Um, and he was a lot older than Octavian. But the portrait of Cleopatra may astonish you because she certainly does not show that kind of beauty you would expect if you saw uh, the movie with Elizabeth Taylor. But the thing about Cleopatra is that she had charisma. She had incredible charm. Um, she had a brilliant mind. She was a polyglot. Um, she was very clever in the way she manipulated Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and waited around to see if it might work with Octavian too. But uh, he wasn't having any of it. And then she had her famous act of committing suicide by allowing herself to be stung by a poisonous serpent. Why is our find important? Well, um, I think the story that it brings out and is verified by looking at the word carefully, that this is probably a veteran of Octavian who came to Chetamora. He buried his treasure there near the well where he would be able to remember it. And we think it's very likely that he also received the land at that time. And in digging in that well, well number one, we noticed a rather sharp change from Etruscan artifacts to Roman artifacts precisely at that moment, between about 40 and 30 BCE. So our hypothesis gets stronger, I think, when we look at all the other things that were dated to around that same time. Now, the treasure is unique in the Chianti area. Um, we're talking about County Storico, which is three main towns of Gaioli, Rada, and Castellina. And there is hardly anything to compare with it. So we think it's adding a lot to knowledge of the region about when things changed from Etruscan to Roman. Scholars refer to this as uh, Romanization. And we also find that uh, many of the coins in the collection are in really good condition. Uh, some are quite recent and scarcely circulated and really beautiful. People tell us they are so pleased that we excavated this with complete documentation very carefully. We've handled it very well since it was excavated. We've had a lot of important uh, assistance financially. I'll tell you more about that. And that normally when coin hoards are found, it's a farmer plowing or digging a, somebody's digging a ditch and they don't really have excavation data about that hoard. And Laura has been telling me one of the main things that's important is that we pulled it out ourselves. We know for sure exactly which coins were in there, how many they were. And so we can give a kind of scientific, scientific information that is rarely available. The other thing I wanna stress is that we have been using innovative techniques of studying the find. And um, of course, we worked very carefully with Saatchi on the conservation. We had a special um, photographic project and uh, we are going to continue the work. We're scheduled to have uh, analysis of all of the metals by um, the Center for National Research of the state of Italy, Chi uh, in Air, Centro Nazionale di Ricerche. Well, what is in the find? Uh, let's look at just a few of the coins. We don't have time to look at very much today. Our favorite is called um, Bonus Aventus. It's a deity. It's not clear whether Bonus Aventus is male or female, but those of you who are Latin students know that Bonus Aventus means something like good outcome or good success. And we thought this was a beautiful coin that gave us good luck. And on the reverse of it, there was a depiction of a wellhead. And this seemed really appropriate in the circumstances. And so we chose it to put on the cover of our publication of the site. I'm not sure how well this is going to show up on uh, the cameras and everything, but I have a copy of the catalog here. It's published by a wonderful firm called Silabe in Livorno. 
And we had a really excellent time working with them and producing the kind of volume that we wanted. So you're looking at the cover. So other things in there. We tried to sort them according to themes for the exhibition in Siena. We have large sections on gods, um, some gods, some goddesses. Um, some are sort of mainstream, such as Apollo and Minerva. Um, then there are personifications like Bonus Aventus. We are especially fond of the coins that have animals on them. We have uh, a number of those with the elephant of Julius Caesar, and also a coin type that shows um, a king from the east, the Near East, King Aretas, with a camel. And uh, so the students really enjoyed bringing these to life. And so we could see what those animals are like. And recently, we have made uh, coloring books for children. Those are already being used to get them interested in coins and their images. This is one that's just one of my favorites. It's just especially beautiful, showing um, Medusa. You know, Medusa is supposed to be very ugly and scary. But there's also a tradition that she went through a period when she was beautiful. And I think on this particular coin, she's both beautiful and scary. And on the reverse side, there is a deity of victory. And we find that uh, quite apart from the 22 coins of the fleet of Antony, we have uh, at least nine coins that refer to victory of Octavian. And they seem to refer to the Battle of Actium because they date exactly to that period. Now, here's Nora Morosi, and this is the special photography project that we did. We used RTI, um, which is a way of taking photographs under a dome, and the dome has lights within it that will blink on and take a shot and then blink off and go on to the next and go all the way around so that you can get a photograph of a tiny object like this with a raking light from all angles. And then those photos are stitched together by photogrammetry. And then you get the image where you have an absolutely uh, the clearest possible uh, depiction of what is on the coin. So there's Nora in the cold winter months doing the photography. Um, she had as her consultant, uh, Jacopo Mazzoni. And Jacopo is the one who invented this uh, stand. And then he and Nora together took thousands, literally thousands of photographs. And so here you see uh, what the stand looks like and you see what RTI stands for, Reflectance Transformation Imaging. And with these photos made by Jacopo Mazzoni and Nora Morosi, we have created a kiosk in the exhibition where people can go and sit down and pick a favorite coin, bring up all the information about it, and then they can use the, um, the prompts to enlarge it, to flip it, to uh, run light around it and see all the different things that come out from different angles. And we hope to establish a kiosk here at um, FSU and in, in the study center so that people will be able to study the coins although the originals will remain in museums under special security and care. And this is a wonderful shot, um, panoramic taken by Katie, um, right at the time of the opening, I believe, and right before the crowd comes in. And um, so it gives you some idea of the harmony we managed to achieve with all of the photographs and the posters and the coins and the information about the coins. And the show will be open until September 2nd because that's the date of the Battle of Actium and that's a turning point. We will take it down at that time. Now, there's still more to the story and that is that we will be having an exhibition here um, all is kind of secret right now, um, but we have our Rodney Reeves scholars who have been working since we got here weeks and weeks ago, and they have a lot of plans for how to show the photographs and also some 3D printing. 
that we've done. And so we'll have the coins themselves on the photos, and we'll also have some other items that are not in the Siena show that will tell more about Chittimora and the long history of what we have found there. I want to congratulate Jamie and Nina, who uh, won a competition to uh, achieve these scholarships offered by Dr. Rodney Reeves. And so what will they show? Here you see the fine arts gallery at uh, the new quarters in the palace at Florida State University, just waiting for the inauguration. We hope to have a ribbon cutting and invite students to be the first guests who will come in and view what's there. Thank you very much. That's great, Anita, we'll see you. Okay, so we wanna thank Dr. DeGroman for that wonderful summary of this exciting moment in FSU's history here in Tuscany. And if anybody has any questions, um, you could unmute yourselves and Dr. DeGrummond or Dr. Holland Goldwaith could answer them. Anybody have any questions about the find, about the coins, about the Chetamura program itself? Fire Frank, away. Frank, why don't we um, finish up the rest of the presentation really quickly so that if folks do need to leave at that one o'clock um, time, they certainly can. Um, we just have one more brief thing to go through and then we will turn it right back over to questions. I just wanna be mindful of everybody's time. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, IP just wanted to extend our warmest thanks to Dr. DeGrumman and to your team and to all of the great work that y'all are doing. Thank you for sharing your time today and your knowledge and thank you for your efforts in preserving this incredible Italian history and sharing with all of us. We are so, so grateful for all that you do. And then um, finally, if you are looking for ways to connect with international programs, to support international programs, showing up today was a great option. We are so grateful to see all of the people that are here and willing and interested in engaging with international programs, with Florence and all the different connections that you each have to our programs. Um, so we wanted to give you some ways that you can continue that support and continue this engagement. Um, so if you are looking for ways to connect with the IP community, engage with and give back to current and future study abroad students, uh, there's an email here on the screen. You've received a couple of emails with that email at the bottom of it. Please reach out, um, ip-alumni at fsu.edu. We are happy to connect you with any of these opportunities. There are opportunities to mentor students um, through a professional mentorship program with the uh, Career Center at FSU. There are specific students who have studied abroad and you can share that experience with them. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in giving financially to support the efforts of IP um, and giving the gift of international education, there is a giving link available on our website. You'll receive it in an email a little bit later on, but there's also some contact information here to one of our friends in the foundation, Sharishmi. And if you are interested in more information or talking about other ways of giving, you can certainly reach out to them as well. Um, and that is all I have. And so with that, I would love to turn it back over um, so that we can um, uh, get some questions uh, for Dr. DeGrumman. So I will allow y'all to unmute yourself. The chat is usually an easier way to share those questions. Um, so if anyone has some questions, feel free to put them in the chat, feel free to unmute yourself and we will re-spotlight Dr. DeGrumman. My own mic now. Yes. Yeah. Maybe we can open some of these. I saw some questions. Here. I, I noticed Jill asked a question. Jill Adams. Hi. Um, Nancy, about I'm what going will to ask you two questions. Um, one is, are you going to have some kind of exhibit here at FSU, either in the Fine Arts Gallery, Museum, or someplace where the Classics Department is? And my second question is, when you found the, the bowl, and you lifted it out and then you were transferring it. It looked like you put it in ice, crushed ice. Is that what that was we saw? No, we did not put it in ice. Um, let me answer your first question and then Laura will come on and talk about what she did when she took it off the site. Um, we had a big surprise at the opening ceremony um, when our inspector got up to speak and 
spoke with great enthusiasm, of course, about everything. And then he said he planned for this to be a traveling show. Huh? And we had not thought that far ahead. So we are beginning to discuss how we might do that. And uh, I said, you want to have a traveling show? Where did you want to send it? He said, to the United States. So uh, he will be behind such a project. It will take an enormous amount of effort and enormous amount of funding. And I just uh, realized that I did not speak specifically about one of our best donors, and that is Friends of Florence. They funded all of the cleaning and conservation and photography. And I know they will continue to support this project. And so I think you know that would be a likely partner for us if, if we can take it to the States. Awesome. So, so, well. so um, I see what you mean about uh, the bubble wrap. It looks like ice, but in fact, it's just very large bubble wrap. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, question about Cleopatra. Did you say that there were several profiles of Cleopatra among your treasures? I'm very curious about how many coins were minted with their profiles. No, we just had the one coin of Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, we also had other coins minted by Mark Antony, but not with Cleopatra. And we also had 22 of the ship coins, the leg legionary denarii uh, that just have the ship and the legionary standards on them. So this, the Cleopatra coin is really special. Uh, we do have a Quinarius that that depicts the goddess victory, and scholars speculate that the goddess is depicted with the features of Antony's wife, Fulvia. So, Hannah, can you rotate the question so we can see what other, other ones there might be? Hi, Nancy, I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Who is it? This is Frank Williams. How are you? Hey, Frank. <laughs> um, my questions, um, first one has to go uh, back to pottery. How about the vessel that the uh, coins were found in? Was that something that may have been a local production or any information about the vessel? Well, we've, we've discussed this a lot. I know you know the fabrics of Chetamora, the fabrics of ceramics pretty well. It doesn't really fit with any of the ones that we normally find. And my impression that it was unlike anything I've ever seen at Chetamora before really continues. And uh, I think Laura might want to say a little bit more about the shape. Well, it's almost like uh, the Greek shape called an aribolos which was generally a perfume container, uh, some kind of unguent. Um, but there are some slight differences that make us doubt that, it, that that's really what it is. So we're still looking for better comparanda for that. And, and one other question is I know that um, other, other coins have been found on the site. Um, is there anything comparable as far as uh, uh, terminus antiquem or anything with the, the coins that uh, might have seen that some of them were, were out and being used for uh, um, purchasing. We do have an answer for that. Go ahead, Laura. I'd like to hear you tell it rather than me. So uh, there are, I believe, three coins from the treasure that uh, we've also found copies of those same coins on the site. Uh, and they're in areas where they could have originally been part of the soldier's pay. Uh, a couple of them came from the, well, the excavation of the well. Uh, and another is from the artisan's 
area on the site. So that was, um, Dr. DeGremon thinks that that was definitely an area where transactions and commerce was taking place. So it's quite possible. Great, well, thank you. But another rather interesting uh, group of coins we found was within the well. Um, the well had about 55 coins total, and it, obviously there was a kind of wishing well effect. People would come and make an offering and pray for the future. And um, there, But there's a group of coins that are a lot alike, and I think you would like these, Frank, because they have to do with the period of the early Roman Empire that you studied with me. Um, there are coins that um, depict members of the Julio-Claudian family starting with Divus Augustus, the, the divine Augustus, and then uh, showing other members of the family such as Caligula, Claudius, and the latest is Nero. And they're all bronzes and they're so much alike that we got the hypothesis that they may have once been all together in maybe a box or a bag. We don't have the container that they were in, but that they may have been deposited in the well quite intentionally. They may have been an offering to the cult of the uh, family, the imperial family. Uh, okay, so uh, how did you get the coins out? Um, that was um, Nancy and, and Nora, so you, you think that Well, was uh, it was done with tiny little tweezers, just one at a time. And mainly they were loose enough to come out one at a time, but there were some that were stuck together they were coins that had um, deterioration of copper that had been especially in the coins of, of Antony. And uh, I think you know that when uh, copper deteriorates, it, it turns kind of green and it gets sticky and corroded. And so those were harder to get out. And uh, I was not there when Nora succeeded in getting them out, but I believe what she did was use a solution that she deposited inside the jug so that that would loosen them up and then they could be extracted that way. But understand they're tiny little coins. They're the size of a um, US dime. So I see another question. Any theory as to how the vessels, vessel got into the ditch? Well, I, I think that the soldier must have decided I'm gonna bury it here and he dug a hole and put it in, covered it up, consecrated it to the gods and just never got back to it. We talked to Dr. Taboli about this and he refers to it frequently as a votive offering, as if it were something for the gods and that it was meant to be buried there and, and stay there. Um, our view is, a, yes, it did have something to do with the fact that that's a sacred area, but that it might be more that um, the owner wanted to put it under the protection of the gods in that area and may well have intended to come back. The thing that is so amazing is that it was only about a foot and a half below ground level and that nobody else ever found it because the site was reoccupied in the Middle Ages. There was extensive building there. We now have a very good hypothesis. That there was once a castle that got torn down and in the building of the castle, it's kind of a miracle that they didn't come across that. Uh, you have a question, future of the dig. I hope it goes on forever. <laughs> um, we have excavated, I would say, less than half of the site of Chetamora del Chianti. Since it's a field school, we dig rather slowly. We're, we're not in a hurry. We spend a lot of time uh, patiently training students and having them help us to um, take notes, keep notebooks, and help with cleaning of the artifacts and the recording and all the different stages of, of excavation. Uh, we hope the program can be reopened. Um, it was very hard last summer um, when you know we were unable to come. And um, this summer, the program was again canceled because at the time we should have opened it up and taken applications, it, was absolutely unthinkable that we would be able to have the program. So we missed um, 2020 and we're missing 2021. I will be in the field with a small staff and we'll be working on um, a kind of study season 
and um, catching up on some things we need to do. And um, I've been working closely with international programs to prepare for the advertising for the season in 2022. So there was a question about uh, how much the coins were worth at the time that they were deposited. The 194 coins is very close to the estimated amount that a soldier would receive for a year's pay. So that would represent a year's wages, if that helps. Are you still doing illustrations of coins that is drawings? No, we're not. <laughs> um, definitely this kind of photography says it all. Um, we're thinking now of getting other coins from the site and doing the same procedure. And we have had an artist who drew coins for us in the past. It's very difficult because they're often so small and hard to see and poorly preserved. And so RTI is the way to go. And we're just thrilled to have that, that funding and the setup provided by Friends of Florence. Somebody else I failed to mention, um, I wanted to give out a shout at the beginning to the, the Mud Angels. I see some of them are here. I see Doreen, for example. I can't see everybody on the screen, yeah. but but I'm so glad uh, they have been very supportive of us. You know, we, we are part of the history together. They, they were here in 1966 during the flood and Chattamore started in 1973. So uh, we're, we're the same generation. It doesn't look like we have any more questions and we are right at one o'clock, right at our hour mark. So thank you so, so much everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. DeGraman and your team again for this presentation and for all the work that you're doing. We are so grateful and so excited that we could uh, learn more about this and more about this dig. So thank you everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you so much. <laughs>